Welcome, colleagues. I think, as Jakob said, it's for us an uh, honor to host this uh, webinar. It's our 15th one that we do under the WCO ESA Regional Private Sector Group. And I think we have a very exciting um, program today. And uh, we have done it a little bit different than the previous ones. We're going to take from the lessons learned to see how is it good or what can we do in terms of the trade facilitation agreements. And it's the committee and there Zambia is going to take us through the very practical case study of what they've done. Then we're going to go to Mauritius, our colleagues in Mauritius, and they're going to tell us how can they do it with digitalization, what they've done, how does it change their processes, and also show them how we bring it much quicker in terms of what can digitalization do in our trading environment. And then our last speaker, we will close off with the WCO to say that if they do work with the landscape that they currently, what do they do in terms of the digitalization, the process, and how do they bring customs and the private sector closer together? And I see my colleague or my chairperson from the WCO regional uh, um, private sector group on the call. Uh, we're actually delighted to have him here. So, Heidi, I know we didn't prep it, but maybe you just can greet us and then we will go straight to the program. I think it's an honor to have you with us in the ESA region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we, we can yeah. hear you. Yes, perfectly. Juanita, and we can see you as well. CEO. Thank you. Yes, always a pleasure to see you and talk to you, to talk to the members of the Southern <clears throat> Eastern um, Africa um, Regional Group. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I could not miss this opportunity to join you. Probably, I don't know if I can stay for the full 90 meters, minutes, but uh, certainly you see, I'm very glad to see you. We are now preparing to uh, travel to Brussels, which I'm leaving later on today via, via Mexico City. And uh, we are going to have a very intense week there. So I understand that you may not join us. Juanita, why are you coming? We can have we can attend hybrid honey in that on Monday. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. But anyway, you see, we will. You see, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we are very active. We are at, uh, now, you see, preparing for our meeting <clears throat> next Monday, and then we are going to participate in the uh, permanent technical commission meeting on the, from Tuesday to Thursday. The Private sector consultative group will make a presentation, which will be on the second day. I don't know if you, uh, I understand that it's only, you see a, a, a live meeting, so there won't be any access to remote uh, uh, participants. But basically there are three things that we want to say to them. And that's probably one is something that I want to share with you. First of all, uh, what we decided is that uh, since this is the uh, highest technical committee in the uh, in in the WCO, it was important to send very relevant messages, and one of them is that we went into our storage boxes and tried to gather all the activities that we had done for the past five years. And uh, we are going to present them to see how much work we've done in the last five years, what uh, <clears throat> documents we generated, what uh, working groups we participated in, and also how we feel that we have evolved in these five years. That's going to be, you see, one of the first messages that we will send. And also we have two pieces of work that we are going to present right now, one, is a work that has been a continuation after the pandemic on the <clears throat> business resilience, especially when there are many threats going around of many different types. And we want to tell the World Customs Organization how the private sector feels that we should work together and we should review what happens in case of a world like we, we, we have unfortunately seen recently and when borders get closed how we can try to reopen them 
in case of there are uh, cyber attacks like have always been around for a long time and suddenly companies you see they get their computer systems all blocked how can customs and the private sector work for these presumptions obviously again in case of a a, a disease a pandemic a earthquakes fires i mean you name it how can trade and customs work together to reactivate all these activities but that's something that you see we're going to be discussing and that's going to be important another another piece of work that will be presented even though it's going to be specified that this is still work in progress which i believe we're at the very last stage to release it is about what a trade facilitation means to the private sector and i think that also you see juanita has participated actively in this group and uh, i feel that we have many things to say so that's something that we are going to be presenting to them and uh, we're then gearing up to <clears throat> june when the policy commission meets and then we can meet with them again for this juanita you see it's always a pleasure to be here and I'll be accompanying you for a while. So please, in case you have any comments, uh, questions, or any other members you see want to express something, I'm very open. Thank you. Thank you, Heine, and indeed a pleasure. So we're going to go straight to the program. So we want to listen to Zambia. So I'm going to ask Patricia to, uh, Jakob's going to help her to bring up a slide. And Patricia, the floor is yours. We're happy to listen to, and to hear your lessons in the Zambia area. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I was trying to put up my my slide, but I think if you help me on that side, I'm not in Lusaka right now. I'm away at the border, so probably I may have some issues, uh, some challenges with internet. So you can okay. run the slide and I'll speak to it. Thank yes, you. Yes, we, we have the slide. Jakob have put it up and we want to hear your story. Thank you very much. It's a success story, if I may add. <laughs> Thank you very much and most, most grateful. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as I am at Chirundu border, I was interacting with my colleagues from immigration and they had a very strange comment because they seem to think that we as customs, the world over know each other and the, the exact comment was that customs is a cult. So I don't know whether we are a cult, but I'm happy to be part of the cult. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in Zambia, uh, you can move the slide, please. Uh, this is just a short outline of my, my presentation. We'll do a background uh, just to tell you who's involved in implementing our trade facilitation measures. Then I'll deal with uh, Article 23.2, which we are all familiar with, which is the National Committee on Trade Facilitation. And we'll have uh, the National Trade Facilitation Committee of Zambia, uh, membership structure, and, and examples of how we are implementing some of our measures with the help from private sector. Thank you very much. You can, you can move. Um, uh, of course, we are all familiar with the fact that the World Trade Organization Agreement was discussed and finally concluded after a long time. It uh, came into being in February. However, we as Zambia ratified the agreement in December 2015. You can move the slide. Uh, who are the people who are party? Like in all your countries, we have various uh, members who are actually party to how we are implementing. Of course, these are both public and private sector, uh, which includes our ministries, our various departments and agencies, our local authorities, and it includes all the associations of our private sector who are doing anything which is linked to trade logistics, import, export. These are the uh, association of the transporters, the custom workers, various manufacturers, including our cross-border traders who are the small-scale traders in Zambia and trade through our various borders. Uh, thank you very much. As you are aware, uh, under the mandate of the World Trade Organization, 
each member country was actually required to either establish or maintain a national committee on trade, trade facilitation, which would be designated as an, a mechanism to facilitate both domestic coordination and implementation of the provision of the agreement. We as Zambia did just that. Uh, we can move. Prior to 2016, the, the, you can move the slide. Prior to 2016, before we ratified the World Trade Organization uh, Trade Facilitation Agreement, we had a lot of different committees undertaking a lot of issues in various areas of trade facilitation. What was then decided was that we should probably merge the various uh, the, the, the various the activities under the various committees into one committee, which is the National Trade and Facilitation Committee, so that we meet our mandate under the agreement and are also able to have one structure for the purposes of facilitating trade and ensuring that we implement our obligations. The National Trade Facilitation Committee of Zambia, therefore, was formed in 2016. Initially, it was formed under cabinet mandate, but later on in 2018, we passed what is known as the Border Management and Trade Facilitation Act to ensure that the National Trade Facilitation Committee was actually set up in law. From the beginning, it has acted as an open, open forum to encourage not on the interagency coordination, but also coordination between public and private sector in, in all areas of trade facilitation and provide direction on trade facilitation issues in the country. We can, we can move. The current structure of our, our National Trade Facilitation Committee is that at the apex of the, of the, of the committee sits the steering committee. The steering committee on trade facilitation is actually chaired in Zambia by secretary to cabinet. Uh, am I the only one who's not getting any voice on this end? Yes, Daisy, we can hear quite clear. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You can yes, continue. Sharing you loud and clear. Okay, so I can continue. Please do so. Okay. So, as I was saying, the structure of the National Trade Facilitation Committee in Zambia, at the apex, we have the Steering Committee on Trade Facilitation. The Steering Committee is actually chaired by Secretary to Cabinet. It oversees the National Trade Facilitation Committee, taken for taken for meeting, and directs policy. The members of the, the, of the committee, which currently starts at, stands at 41 members, are various ministries, departments, and agencies, as already indicated. So in the steering committee, these sit at the level of permanent secretaries, heads of institutions, heads of the various border agencies, and senior members of the representatives of the various private sector member associations, which we have, which include our Chamber of Commerce. It includes, as I said, the Association of uh, Transporters, our Association of the Customs Brokers, the various uh, chambers. We also have the chambers of mines, the committee on farmers, and uh, the cross-border traders. So all these all sit on the committee at the highest level. Then we have the National Trade uh, Facilitation Committee itself at a technical level. Currently, it's co-chaired by Permanent Secretary Minister of Commerce with the Commissioner of Customs Zambia Revenue Authority. The same agencies sit but sit on this on this one at a technical level so that they can actually discuss at a technical level all the various trade facilitation activities and offer solutions which they then recommend to the steering committee. The Secretariat of the National Trade Facilitation Committee to which I belong is actually based at our Ministry of Commerce and Trade. And as I indicated, the Zambia Trade, National Trade Facilitation Committee was actually set up by law, and in the Act, it provides that at any given time, Zambia Revenue Authority Customs Division shall second a senior officer to sit with the, at the Secretariat at Ministry of Commerce. And from 20, since 2016, we have had someone from Zambia Revenue Authority sitting at the Ministry of Commerce as part of the Secretariat of the National Trade Facilitation uh, Committee to ensure coordination of all the various trade facilitation issues as customs is, uh, is customs is one of the key players when it comes to trade facilitation. As indicated, we currently have 41 members, which the 41 members which are drawn from both public and private sector. This is just a structure of how our committee looks. It also works through subcommittees of which we have five right now and taken specialized taken for working group. 
groups which are charged with implementing specific issues. Uh, one an, an example we have a specialized working group, for example, on time release studies, which cons which consists of various member agencies who oversee how Zambia is implementing or is undertaking time release studies and actually undertake studies as part of this working group. Uh, one of the deliberate policies which was taken is that all our subcommittees and taken by working groups are chaired by private sector, by public sector, co-chaired with the private sector. So when we have the association, for example, on, on, on uh, time release studies, we have it chaired by Zambia Revenue Authority, co-chaired by members, by members of the private sector the customs brokers we have other associations which are co with other committees which are co-chaired with the transporters and and so on depending on what the purpose of that particular committee is further to that we have the border committees at specific borders some of the most active border committees are the border committee we have at kazungula which is one of our borders with which is our border with botswana the border committee at nakonde which is our border with tanzania the border committee at Chirundu, which is our border with uh, with, uh, with with Zimbabwe, our, we intend to have border committees at all our major borders. Uh, I may say at this point that Zambia is a landlocked or land-linked country, so we have in excess of over 40 borders. However, we do, the major ones are probably about 12 or so currently. These are some of the major borders we have. We share direct borders with our, with eight other African countries as well as, uh, as as Zambia. So we can, some of the measures which we've been able to, we've benefited from a way of, especially this involvement of private sector, uh, for example, how we've implemented Article 6, which, which has to do with uh, publication and establishment of average release times. Our technical committee, which deals with this actually includes private sector and actually was trained in 2019 by the World Customs Organization, who trained both public and private sector. And both of us have actually worked together to, input, to undertake several time release studies at our common borders and ensure that our findings and all the challenges we are finding, private sector comes with us and they are able to indicate and able to see that solutions are actually being put in place by the various agencies, even as we identify. The last time release study we just undertook, whose report we are working on, was we actually undertook with the support of JICA. This was at Kazungula uh, one-stop border post which we share with Botswana and Chirundu one stop border post which we share with uh, with Zimbabwe. We are just actually working on the report on the report with that and that is uh, some of the some of the activities which we have undertaken with the help of private sector because of the fact that we've involved private sector in a lot of our trade facilitation measures. We can move Beyond WTFA, I can give another example. We have had issues like where our transporters, as indicated, Zambia sits on several transport cor corridors, the North-South Corridor, the Da Corridor, the Nakala Corridor. So we do have a high number of vehicles transiting through the country, apart from our own imports. One of the measures which was at one of the challenges which was identified by our transporters and several other transporters in the region was, for example, the number of police checkpoints we had through the country on the various uh, on the various uh, corridors. This was uh, something which was actually brought up to the National Trade Station Committee by the transporters as one of our private sector members, and it was taken up and a special meeting, an ad hoc meeting of the steering committee was actually called to actually resolve this issue. And the various agencies who were involved, well, they, they sat around the table in the meeting of the steering committee and decisions were undertaken. As a result of this intervention, the number of roadblocks which we had in Zambia were significantly reduced to only leave those which were key and were actually there for the protection of motorists and any other. Any other. But these are some of the, the benefits we've actually gotten from the fact that we have involved our private sector in the various measures which we're undertaking and have given them the, the leeway to be able to bring up all issues of trade facilitation even as we face challenges. Thank you very much. If we can move. I can also give an example. Zambia is currently implementing provisions of Article 8 under border agency coordination. Uh, government took a decision in, 2020, in, in 2022, 2023, that we were going to reduce the number of agencies at our border from 18 currently to six agencies. In order to undertake this, 
a, mm, to undertake this, a roadmap was drawn up of how we were going to undertake it. A, a technical working group comprising, again, both public and the private sector was put up. And as part of undertaking this exercise, we, with or we, both public and private sector, undertook a study tour to Botswana to see how they were doing it in order for us to then be able to do our own implementation. Uh, just uh, the past week, we are coming from a situation where the roadmap is now fully drawn. We have already started uh, engaging everybody in terms of legislative reviews in order to, to see to see this uh, this uh, this activity to fruition, so they, all these we've been able to do, bringing our private sector on board. Thank you. We can move. One of the other measures, probably, which we are dealing with uh, with our private sector, has been the implementation of Article 10.6, the use of customs brokers. Zambia stands guided uh, by a process which fully incorporates all stakeholders and especially the private uh, private sector. We undertook joint, a joint study tour to go and see how others in other countries are dealing with this and identified that we needed capacity building for our colleagues, uh, the customs brokers, we actually identified the various the, uh, gaps on capacity building and have actually approached several partners to assist us and have right now a cooperating partner who's actually assisting us with the issues of capacity building for our custom brokers. And this is, this is because we have actually brought them on board to ensure that we are all moving together for the purposes of us achieving a common goal and seeing how we can move from there. Thank you very much. If you can move. As I indicated, as Zambia, we can give various areas which have actually indicated. One of the areas I can actually talk about is the fact that prior to 2019, even as we brought our, our colleagues from both private sector onto our, on our, onto our taken court meetings, they were, they were only able to attend the, meet, the, the meetings of the subcommittees at taken court working group and the National Trade Facilitation Committee. However, in 2019, they actually presented to the steering committee, which is headed by Secretary to Cabinet, that they desired to actually be able to even be on the meeting of the steering committee so that they are able to bring their issues. And I should say at that point, the steering committee led by Secretary to Cabinet did challenge all the agencies as to why private sector was not allowed to be on this meeting. And the decision was taken that if we, are, we regard private sector as full partners in this in, in this uh, area of trade facilitation we needed to bring, bring them on board all the meetings and since april 2019 our private sector actually that is when they were able to sit even on the steering committee and able to bring their issues and we should say having gone through that exercise we've seen that it has built the way we have moved in terms of trade facilitation even as we face the challenges we face them together and that is something which we are actually encouraged to do thank you very much colleagues Patricia, I think the colleagues is in awe listening to you because I think that's what we need to hear, that uh, private sector and customs uh, administration and other government agencies can work together and uh, we can involve all the stakeholders. And what's for me fascinating that you were bringing the time release study in as one of your solutions. And also, I think the co-chair, that makes it very important. And thank you very much. And the last comment that I want to make, it's not a landlocked country. I think we want to refer it as, after listening to you, maybe a land link country because you link uh, the rest of Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm most grateful for that. Thank you. So I'm going to go to my colleagues in Mauritius. They can show us what they've done with digitalization. And I think you can take us on your journey because we want to learn and want to see how great you've done. So over to the team in Mauritius. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I'm Charan here speaking from Mauritius. Yes, loud and clear. Yes, okay. Very nice. OK, thank you. I'll just share my screen quickly and uh, uh, I'll present my slide myself. OK, so um, you can see the slide. Yeah, perfect. Yes, we okay, can. Good. Perfect. OK, thank you very much. Uh, let me present myself. I'm Charan Debi Singh, the CEO of uh, Mauritius Cargo Community Services. And uh, just uh, my background, I was uh, previously uh, the head of IT Customs, uh, Mauritius Customs and uh, also the uh, lead expert at the WCO, and as well, I'm an accredited TFA expert from the World Customs Organization. So um, 
Today, uh, what I'm going to present a bit is uh, our company, the Mauritius Cargo Community Services. They, we are actually uh, operate through the license of the Mauritius Customs. Uh, the, 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 the legal aspect is, is here that we, we support all uh, the port community system uh, and the manifest information which is getting coming into, into the country and uh, at the import level and the export level as well. So uh, our role is, uh, before I would get in a bit more on the customs link to business uh, community, this is the main agenda today, I'll probably go about what we, what is our role and how we are helping the trade community to bring, uh, to, to, to enhance the trade supply chain as well as bringing uh, technology uh, to our business partners in uh, in trade. And uh, I will, for the Mauritius Cargo Committee, Committee Services, uh, we have also diversified our, port, our portfolio of services to enable our business partner as well as the authority to work together uh, and link, data, link for exchange of data across the trade supply chain. We have also, uh, we'll talk a bit about what our digital roadmap in Mauritius and how we can share our uh, experience uh, at the regional level as well. So, like I said, Mauritius MSCCS, uh, we are here since 2008. We are also, uh, we are a trade facilitator. Uh, we, uh, in, the tra in the cargo community, uh, both air and sea, we ensure that we, 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 we ensure security, efficiency, and visibility, as well as transparency in data exchange uh, or in the trade community. So whatever information, uh, data, manifest information coming or leaving the country, it goes through the MSCCS. And we are a public-private company with the government of Mauritius uh, on board, as well as the Chamber of Commerce, the Export Association, and all those uh, parties rated in the trade community. So, uh, like I said, uh, our role is to manage trade information. We are, I would say we are a company fully with uh, 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 software engineers, technical people who are here to, uh, to facilitate the movement of data across the trade supply chain. And uh, we, we believe we're a strategic partner to both the authorities and the business sector to facilitate trade in Mauritius. Our role is to really to push on to promote trade facilitation and reduce the dual type of trade and cost of trade, which is an, a, a major factor um, uh, in the trade community right now. We, 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 we believe that uh, the adoption of inter international best practices like the WCO safe framework of standards, data model to ensure standardization of, of of information across the trade supply chain, a single window concept to um, to to have all the services of trade under mm -hmm. the same umbrella, the use of non-intrusive inspection like X-rays, uh, um, like X-rays, the use of IoT, Internet of Things in the port, the anal the analytics of of data. These are the technology we want to bring to the trade community, and which will bring. Uh, efficiency in in to our business partners, our business partners who are doing whether it's importers, exporters, freight forwarding agents. So, like you can see, our com our company, the MSCS, we are we 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 are a catalyzer in the process of and and data exchange of trade of of trade data in the supply chain. We are connected to the port authority. We are connected to the shipping agents who are. Uh, from the private sector, we have the import export work from the private sector. We submit information to customs. Uh, we facilitate uh, the job of customs in terms of uh, targeting profiling of uh, for risk management for uh, for for risky goods, so that they don't need to do uh, full uh, inspection. We our system also is connected to the brokers and the freight forwarders as well. So as you can see, we are here to build the trade ecosystem. The trade ecosystem, which which uh, actually includes the customs, the port, and the entire business community. Uh, since uh, uh, last year, we after the COVID, I would say, uh, we found that uh, 
business community cannot work alone. That is, they have their information uh, at the end and then they have to submit again to customs. So what we have done at the MSCS, we have diversified our portfolio of services to enable to enable the business community to also digitalize their services, their, their, their processes. So today we have uh, solutions like for our business partners, we have solutions for uh, for ground handling agents, that is those uh, handling of cargo, whether it's import and export. We are also uh, have developed uh, certain major projects for the authorities, uh, like the vessel clearance system, uh, which we are which we have done uh, together with our uh, our another partner, Mauritius Network Service. We have e bunkering system, which facilitate the bunkering of, of shipping lines. We have also uh, like uh, solutions like dashboards where we can where our business partners can have a visibility on on the shipments uh, to minimize the dwell time, to minimize our, in terms of costs. And also we have embarked on trade facilitation e-services as well, as 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 uh, as per the WTO TFA uh, agreement. So we we provide we provide uh, a lot of solutions to our partners, and we believe in uh, also like of like in order to cut costs or to have more flexibility or scalability of our solutions. Today, MSCS is 100% on cloud. It is important to emphasize on that because today we have the uh, the opportunity to, to present to our stakeholders, to our trade partners, solutions uh, which where they don't need to invest massively uh, in terms of software, hardware, and all that. Today we are using uh, the cloud computing uh, where they can just connect easily. They don't need to have an IT support. All everything is being handled. Uh, from our side with our Oracle, with the Oracle partner. We are an Oracle partner actually. And uh, they have just to focus on their on their on their on their activities, the trade activities. And uh, and uh, and most uh, most of our clients are happy today moving from an on-premise where they have you know physical service and all that and today they are moving into cloud computing. And uh, the challenge now what we have seen uh, is that authorities, private sectors, they all having they have a system, information system, but their information system is in silos. So they 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 like a private sector, he will he will do his, he will prepare his invoicing, he will he will lies, he will prepare the the um, uh, these imports application and all that on his system, and then uh, uh, for submission of to the authorities, he will probably have to use the customs management system. So yeah. What we see is that information is being inserted in different systems, right? Documents are being generated and, and, and shared in different systems. We have seen uh, controlling agencies, that is a payment to the controlling agencies, whether it's customs, whether it's at the port, whether it's a, uh, the, the Ministry of Health and all that, you have to move and do payments on separate platforms or even have to move physically to do payments. We have seen like uh, the the private sector, the business partner have to do multiple, have to multiple entry of data in different systems. Sometimes you have inconsistency in terms of documents submitted to the authorities. We see delay in application process and which results to an increase in dwell time and cost of trade. Today, we can't afford this kind of, 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 of delays and, and, and costs. We, we are talking about efficiency in the trade and, and what is important is to see link between the business partner and the authorities like customs. So what we need to do is the business partners information system should be interfaced with customs and port system uh, so that when they are doing a single entry in the system, it is it through the interface, it goes to the customs department, it goes to the port department, port authorities. And we also looking into some kind of single uh, platform of services in the trade community. So, like a business partner, when it's when they're going uh, to do a payment, they have a dashboard. They they know exactly, uh, you know, uh, what payment they have to do, and it's on a single platform. They can do the payment at the customs. They can do the payment at the ministries. They can do the payment at at a different level without like uh, using different platforms. 
We have also seen that it is important to have some kind of alert mechanism in the trades uh, uh, on, the, on the trade uh, platform so that you get notification in case of any issues. So this this kind of notifications help you to to uh, to be more efficient in the trade supply chain so that if you're moving your uh, your containers, you are you're doing everything just in time. And also. Uh, like I can show you in this. What we want to do is, is uh, to have like the, the the stakeholders in trade, like we have the brokers, freight forwarding agents, shipping agents, shipping airlines, uh, shipping lines. They all have the information system which are linked with uh, the, the 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 trade portal, the trade portal where you have all you have where you have all the services, uh, whether you're talking about uh, submission of a bill whether you're talking about submission of certificate of origins, any trade permit you need. So all is on a single uh, platform integrated. Uh, no, normally it is hosted by customs. And you will see also in the, you, you have a central repository of, of trade data of, of where you can, you, can, you can have the trade related documents who are, which are uh, centrally uh, uh, reposited so that it, you don't need to have duplicate submission of these trade documents. And, and at the low end, you have the authorities, the customs people or the port people, they just interact with, uh, with, uh, with this, uh, with the entire landscape here, as, as, as we can see. So what we, are, what we want to do is to link, to make sure that uh, the linkage between the, uh, the business partner and the authorities is seamless. Data exchange is seamless, and which will bring a lot of efficiency in the trade supply chain. We have a, to achieve this. There is a roadmap behind. The first thing is stakeholders engagement. We need to engage authorities and the business partners need to engage. We need to discuss about the future of trade, which has changed a lot since uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, we need to have them as a partner in trade, the business people. We have to change customer service in terms of customer experience. We have to be more closer to their needs. One of the important part is about capacity building, uh, is about how we can uh, uh, bring, uh, like capacity building help in terms of risk to, 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 to eliminate any resistance to change. Because when you're moving from a paperless, from a paper to a paperless environment, when you're digitalization, there's a lot of, 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 of uh, there's a lot of uh, resistance to that. Other thing is very important is when we are talking about integrating a system, we have to bring new technology. Today, uh, it is important to have, uh, you know, AI based applications. Uh, you have data analytics for, for predictive, for you to, to predict your, you know, uh, for business partners to be able to predict their import and export. Uh, we have to, to embark on security in terms of blockchain, like for rules of origin, you need such certain technology like that. And what we also thinking is what we have built in terms of best practice, we promote that at, in, at regional level. So that countries like regional countries, those who are in the ESA regions, we don't need to reinvent what other country has done. It can be, we can share our knowledge, we can share our expertise, we can even replicate solutions, easy solutions. Why? Because we are using best practices uh, as per WCO best practice, as per IMO, uh, and, 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 and that's very important today to see this linkage between the authorities and the business uh, partners. And one of, this is our role of MSCS is to, this, to do this bridging between the private sector and the public sector. So I thank you for that. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm most welcome to, to, to respond to your questions. Thank you. Colleagues, the Mauritius team is not finished. I've got another two colleagues that want to present. Is that fine? I think that's how it's been. So we can hand over to the next colleague. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm uh, Rajesh Awamai from the Mauritius Network uh, Services Limited. As uh, Chowen was saying, uh, I'm the partner in this uh, trade uh, uh, journey. So let me let me just uh, go back and just 
I just share my screen. Uh, well, you're busy sharing right. your screen, so maybe if mm -hmm. I just can give the colleagues, is that uh, when we work in the regional private sector group, um, your name came up frequently and it was done from Mozambique. So Mozambique is together very proud of the system in, in Mauritius. So just to give some feedback while your screens was coming through, but over to you and let me listen further to the great solutions in your country. Thank you very much. Uh, and. Uh, Good, good afternoon to colleagues uh, across uh, the SA region. So uh, I will just add up to what uh, uh, Charan has been uh, speaking. In fact, Charan was uh, talking about uh, MECCS, uh, which is a partner with uh, MNS in this uh, e trade uh, journey that we have in Russia. So, so representation. Right. Uh, just uh, to give uh, a, a, a look at what MNS, uh, how it's constituted. MNS, as uh, similar to, to MSCCS, uh, has been conceived as a public private partnership. And uh, our membership, uh, you will see here the Chamber of Commerce, the Port Authority, the Cargo Handling uh, Corporation, which is a full fledged operator of the uh, cargo, uh, the container terminal. Uh, the State Investment Corporation and also the Mauritius uh, Telecom. And uh, when uh, you see it is that this was an, uh, the idea of the MNS was initiated by the Ministry of uh, Finance and Economic Development uh, way back in 1994. And uh, as you see, it's a public private partnership. And uh, you would see members uh, of the public sector organizations, as I said, and also the private sector organizations on the board together with independent directors. Uh, MNS uh, is uh, set up for uh, trade facilitation, and uh, this is the core of what we've been doing. And you would see that uh, we have come up with an e-trade facilitation uh, suite of solutions, uh, where you would see the customs management system and also TradeNet and uh, TradeLink. Uh, TradeNet being the uh, systems that are used by the customs brokers and the freight forwarders so that they can submit their customs declaration, uh, whilst the TradeLink is the solution that is being used by ministries and departments for the permits. Uh, if you need health permit, you need any other sector permit, so all these permits are also integrated in it, and obviously the customs management system is the one that is the core, the heart of it, that is run by the uh, customs department. Uh, we, because we are in the facilitation business, uh, in the trade facilitation business, we are also in the uh, in the tax facilitation and also business registration. So, and our objective is to bring in uh, really a process-based approach and quality uh, is a solution that comes out of it. Uh, we ensure transparency, we ensure good governance, and uh, we want efficiency, cost reduction, integration, and business intelligence out of the data that we have. Now, just to give you an example of uh, how it works, um, if we see here, this uh, this picture gives you an, an idea of how it works. So you have uh, the freight forwarders, the shipping agents, uh, they uh, also, the they would be submitting manifest, and uh, you would see those manifest coming in and also coming in from uh, the uh, MACCS. But the custom brokers on the other side, they would be submitting application for custom declaration. They would be uh, using our application, and the bill of entries would come in into our system. And for that, uh, they are using what we call the trade net system, as I said. Uh, and this would be submitted, delivered to the customs management system, and the customs management system then would be uh, analyzing it, and it has its rules engine that is going to see uh, what, uh, which of those applications are concerning cargo or goods that need to be, uh, that are risky, that would need to be inspected, those that can be cleared very fast, so there is this rules engine that is going to uh, deliver to the customs management system the intelligence to be able to uh, sort out from all the cargo that is coming in, which one that we need to uh, look into and which one would uh, be just cleared and, and move forward. Um, what is also important, as, uh, as I said, is also the trade link. 
because uh, whenever we have uh, such goods and we need to have uh, uh, permits or certificate uh, approvals uh, that we need to, to be able for customs management to clear them, the ministries, departments involved, uh, what we call them government agencies, OGAs, uh, would be uh, parties, they are integrated in the ecosystem. They uh, go online and within the system, they can give uh, their clearances. So this is very interesting because they get the request, they process it at their end and they issue the clearances. Whilst the manifest, as I said, we go through the MSCCS system and the MSCCS is going to deliver it to customs or uh, to ports authorities or the cargo handling corporation. So, in fact, it's an ecosystem that builds uh, together all the uh, partners, the stakeholders, uh, and uh, we have two public sector, uh, public private sector uh, partners uh, in the MNS and Max to deliver this service. Uh, in more details about the trade net, as I said, uh, it services the uh, freight forwarders and uh, the submit trade documents and like manifest declarations, certificates of origin, import export permits to various authorities um, and commercial banks. Also LinkedIn, because whenever there are payments to be effected, so I think this was uh, clear, it's in the same, next screen we'll see it. The, uh, the commercial banks are also involved in it so that electronic payments can be can be made uh, effectively. So it's a trade net portal that uh, that brings in all the stakeholders together so we can deliver the service, right? And uh, it was set up in, uh, in it was set up in uh, 1994. So it has a huge, a long story, a long history of operation and improvement in the process and how we deliver services. Now the trade link, uh, the trade link came in, came in in uh, 2000 and uh, in the 2000, and uh, it's where we brought in uh, the because we realized uh, for trade facilitation it's not only the custom brokers, uh, the port authorities, and all. Uh, it's also about those ministries and departments delivering permits, so they have been brought in. And today, for example, you can see the trade link uh, for the Ministry of Environment, where they also have a dashboard to know uh, how many trans how many uh, applications they have, which one are incomplete, which one are complete, which one need uh, any action on it. So they are able to follow up on their work. Uh, the customs management system, as I said, is the heart of what we have built. Uh, the customs management system has a lot of services, you would say, whether it is in uh, bill of entry and managing all that and all the permits, integrating all the services together. And this is what the customs management system uh, delivers. And uh, this is what the customs department is, is using to manage. And uh, what is good also is that because it is custom built, because it is bespoke, uh, as government introduces new measures every year to facilitate and to render the, the uh, fa trade facilitation even better, uh, whatever measures are delivered by government through the budget, uh, these are also being integrated into the solution. The solution has its own life. It is being improved as we go along and integrating new solutions, integrating new features as we go along. So the future roadmap, I think, uh, has already uh, been uh, shared by uh, uh, by Charon. So we're just adding on it. So uh, blockchain technology, as he mentioned, IoT, machine learning, AI, big data analytics, and also about the integrated single window. Uh, this is the future of uh, how we see the uh, trade facilitation happening uh, over the years. Uh, just to end, I would uh, also share the contact details of uh, our head of business and uh, our chief product officer. So we are very much willing to extend some, uh, our assistance. So you can reach out to us and uh, we'd be happy to, to help you on that. Uh, yes, uh, hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rinesh. Thank you very much. I think you've got a, a third colleague from Mauritius. Is yes. that right? Precisely. 
Yes, yes, yes. That's yes. fine. I, I think we, mm. we have you within the time slot, so we would listen. To, so if you can hand over to your colleague. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Mr. Delbo? Yes. Mr. Delbo, you can go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, if you wait, wait, wait. Ah, I don't. I do not have. Uh, good evening to everybody. I do not have any presentation to 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 exhibit. But I will explain. I will talk to you about my experience in digital digitalization of the custom system, digitalization of the trade of the trade environment. It is not new for us. Yeah, me, me, as my concern, I am not a technical person in IT, but I am, I am a user, I, and I represent users of the IT infrastructure to, con to, to communicate with custom and also in, in the trade environment. So, historically, in the year 1990, we came with digitalization. We come to use computer at a time when custom brokers do not know how to switch on a how to switch on a computer it was a very hectic time we did not know how to connect a printer to a computer and it is and we were using a typewriter long brand typewriter and we were using so lot of papers and now and at a certain moment policy decision came we have to change this and then we came with the asicuda system but so we are we were happy with the asicuda system but not that so much because government want to have like a dashboard. Government want to have a dashboard to have a at real time how many declarations are made, what type of declaration are made, et cetera, et cetera. So policymakers decide that we should have a we, we should have that that dashboard they wanted. And this dashboard happened to help us a lot. And we come to develop the uh, the trade net system with the Singaporean people. So we use uh, custom brokers, uh, custom officers, and explain to IT people how we work and how to translate our working environment into a new environment, which is uh, electronic digitalization, et cetera. And we come to use the uh, trade net system, which is a platform mainly used for custom declaration. So it happened like this. We are all connected to the platform and we have visibility. Once, once our goods are manifested, we can proceed and make our declaration. So we have moved from phase to phase, from different phase. And the last phase that we, the last phase that we reach with digitalization is electronic payment, and we go further. We go further when we have a new director of custom appointed, and the new director of custom, Mr. Rambaran, say, we should go paperless. I say, why not? And then it happens that, we are now we, we are now purely digitalization and we are a, comp, a paperless declaration of custom with all documents that is our we are doing the same job eh? as a custom broker all me and my colleague we are doing the same job as our predecessors our ancestors were doing uh, as we got to custom declaration but differently our life has completely changed from one side to other side and now all, all our staff that we employ staff, we ask them, are you IT conversant? Are you IT literate? Do you know IT? That is the first thing now when we do our employment. As we go to custom declaration, this is our, this is our main line of business. We can teach everybody, but we are not IT people. So now to employ people, is starting as a custom clock, as a trainee, those persons should be IT people. So we have we have we have diverted completely to the digitalization. So what is this being? Make our life happy. What what digitalization make as regard from the uh, private sector? Make life easy and make people happy. So we come further with a non paper non paper. So Hanawa with this, we receive documents from supplier, and we take the same documents. We make our declaration on the MNS, Mauritius Network Services Trade Portal, and this goes to the custom management system, who it is now it is on the other counter of the custom. They decide how to treat the how to treat the the, the declaration has been made. Now, 
Furthermore, we want to know, uh, policymakers want to have a clear view how goods are being moved physically once they are uh, declared until they reach the final destination. How to put all the parties, including the holders, including all the, the process of the bill at real time. Then we, go, then we came with the CCS, the cargo community system, with, uh, managed by the, another platform called the uh, MSCCS. This is where the MSCCS came into action. And then we came with this uh, with a platform of MSCCS so that we may know the status of our declaration at real time. You know, the customs, they have their own issues. And we, representative of the business community, we have our own issues. Customs, they are concerned with security, with revenue collection. This is their main target. And sure, for, they say, yes, customs will tell you, yes, we want trade facilitation. Of course, we want trade facilitation. We want to dynamize the economy, our national economy, but security is an issue. Of course, secondly, revenue collection is an another, but secondary, but another important issue. You, we people, we want trade facilitation. We want goods to move fastly and efficiently out of custom. We do not want our goods to remain in custom zone, in port zone, in, or in airport cargo zone. This is. So we have two lines of business with, with each of them with their own objective, with, own, with people with their own expectations. So that's why how digitalization has bring us together. We have come together on a platform. And this platform, the custom can have visibility on the movement of goods. All the parties, the importer are declared, the shipper are declared, the transporter are declared, the haulier are declared, even the driver. The driver of the lorry are uh, declared, and the lorry also is registered on the platform. That way, where the MSCCS, the cargo community system, came, came into actions that facilitate. And now everybody can say they are happy. The custom have a control of what is being declared, who is being declared, what are the people, what are the people behind all these business, and the business community. They also, they are happy that good can move fastly and efficiently out of custom and reduce costs. And of course, I will, I know many people tell me, what is the cost? What it costs the business community to have such facility? So for the trade net system to make a declaration at custom, it costs $3. So each time we make a declaration, it's the declaration is a manifest. We make a declaration for an importer manifest. It depends. You have, you have one, you have two, you have three containers, you have a small consignment, you have a big consignment, it is three dollars. Now, to the follow-up of the, of, the, of the cargo, to get the delivery, to get the gate pass, everything at, at real moment, this costs us seven dollars. So three plus seven, the business community pay ten dollars to use both platforms. And this ten dollars, what they get, they get the facilities to make the declaration online twenty four seven. So you can make the now it is web. I can you can come to me. I can come to you there in Africa and have my system there and make a declaration at customs twenty four seven. And we also have access to know. We don't. We also have access to know the status of our declaration. What is the status at custom? The good the. The bill has been validated. This we know. Custom. What is the control the custom is doing on uh, as regard to to the particular declarations, and at what time the cargo has leave the cargo has leave the custom terminals, the port terminals, and what uh, which lorry has taken the the container outside of the custom premises. This is what we get in terms of informations as regard for our $10. But what it benefits us, you know, I have to talk to it. You have what you call T-money, speed money. All this has been vanished. And you do not have uh, the things that you have. You know someone that will give you a special attention, a preference over others, OK? Because all the declarations, once validated, they are numbered. And that custom, they are treated numbered one numbered wise that is each number one of the zero set so 
my dear colleagues and friends from mainland Africa, uh, it happens that I have been the president of FACFASA for four years. I have, I have experienced many of the system, not because I am, in, I am a Mauritian, and I'm telling you, I can tell you, if you have a system, you can have the best system. The best system is the trade net system for making custom declaration, very easy, very friendly and easy to use, easy to use. We can train some people in, in two sessions. We can, two sessions of three hours, we, because I am in training also, in two sessions of two hours, we can train someone how to use, how to use a MNS platform, of course, but the person should be, should be uh, conversant with HS code, with custom regimes, with all the process that custom required. So in two sessions of three hours, we can train any custom broker, any freight forwarder, any custom clock or shipping clock in two sessions, how to use the MNS, MNS system with practical, with practical training. As regard to the CCS, very easy. It is a platform you got on. You put all the information you required when you are registered and you know the you know the, the status of your declaration. And on the other side, our custom people, they are very happy. They also, all these things are there. And I must tell you one thing, uh, in the past, in my office, I have five big cupboards, you know, five big cupboards of metals, just to keep all these documents. Now I do not have any, I do not have, a, I get rid of all of these, of these cupboards because we are paperless. So the purchase, the cost of buying paper, it is now one tenth of what it was before. So I have, I have shared with you my experience as a user and my, and my experience not as a user only of the two systems, MNS, MNS and the CCS, but what digitalization has bring into a change of mindset, into a change of life. And uh, one more thing I should add, Madame Gianata, is that, you know, when you bring change, you have many resistance. We have also witnessed resistance because people were used with their paper. People were used to going to custom. People were used to queue at the cash of the custom. When we tell them, you do not have to do this anymore now, your life will change. So many people were unhappy. And we have to educate them to tell them, yes, your life will be changed, but your life will be easy. Your life will be easy. So you also, you will have to experience this even at the custom sites and even at the private sector sites when people are used to do it. And then, people's, and then we have many people where that were nearly 50 years, 55 years, 60 years. And they say, you know, it's not time for me to go and learn a new environment a new method of doing business of doing business this is the resistance when you come to digitalization that you will have to face and you will have to face it very hard you know change changing mindsets changing attitude changing towards to, um, uh, thinking attitude toward change is very resistant thank you very much madam Thank you, Azel. Thank you very much, Azel. I think you, with the other two colleagues from Mauritius, uh, with Zambia, really enlightened us because Zambia was taking us from the trade facilitation and how they have coordinate co-host TRS. You were coming very much more to the practical. How do you take declaration, the cargo net system? You do risk profiling screening, but you link it back to the safe framework and uh, the WCO instruments, and you articulate the experience quite well. So the last panelist or the last speaker on the program is another than least the WCO to, to give us an indication on how do they see digitalization is going to help us in the different standards. So, Christian, I'm going to hand over to you. I hope you find it so far quite insightful from Zambia and Mauritius, but over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, it was very insightful and thanks a lot uh, and greetings from the WCO secretary here in Brussels. And uh, I'm happy to provide for my presentation. Uh, just I, I need to share it. Just yes, move. your audio and you look really nice on the screen. So we're happy to listen to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for the feedback. Um, can you see my slides? Perfect, Christian. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. So, in my, my my name is Christian Lemker. I'm um, 
technical attaché with the um, World Customs Organization Secretariat, and one of my responsibilities is the harmonization of uh, the digital harmonization, and in particular the WC data model and the globally network customs concept. In my presentation today for this webinar, I will be focused on how to streamline the flow of goods and uh, flow of information by strengthening the interconnectivity between customs and trade using global standards. So um, to fulfill uh, their uh, task, it's traditionally the collection of duties, um, it's trade facilitation, uh, and increasingly, increasingly the uh, protection of society, customs, authorities, and other cross-border regulatory agencies uh, require data which used to be transmitted on paper forms, but now almost entirely digitally processed by uh, the uh, authorities' national IT systems. When we look, um, when we look at the supply chain, we, uh, we can divide it into two streams, the flow of physical goods, and the flow of information. So information uh, create and exchange by numerous stakeholders in the form of business to business documents, such as uh, invoices uh, and bill of ladings, which contain information uh, not only relevant for uh, private stakeholders, but uh, also uh, gathered, collected um, by cross-border regulatory agencies to fulfill uh, regulatory requirements, such as uh, the customs declaration. So in, in the context of modern border management, uh, data is uh, collected in a single window environment by the importing and the exporting country. Um, the objective of a, a single window is that uh, the data uh, need to be submitted only once to a central system, which shares the information with the competent authorities, such as customs, phytosanitary, and uh, veterinary, for example. So WCO promotes uh, the interconnectivity between customs, IT systems, and national single window systems through the globally networked customs concept. Um, the globally networked customs concept, or GNC, is a standardized approach in the context of uh, bilateral and multilateral agreements on information sharing that can be uh, also replicated by other WCO members. So, um, so they, the, the idea is not to reinvent the wheel once the specification for data exchange is uh, published uh, uh, as part of the GNC. We call it utility block. Um, this can be used also to uh, establish further uh, data exchange among our members. The main purpose of um, customs to customs interconnectivity is to establish a data exchange, for example, the export declaration and certificates such as the certificate of origin to support real-time risk assessment, reduce clearance time through advanced data and uh, on goods and conveyance, and to support um, post-clearance customs interventions. This uh, government-to-government -government exchange of information is one step towards making controls and trade more efficient. A further step uh, happens open ups when we look uh, at the vast amount of information that is exchanged in the supply chain between private stakeholders. This information uh, relevant to authorities is usually provided as what we call uh, supporting documents, for example, to supplement a customs declaration in, uh, in paper form, or better, but not ideal, scanned as a PDF file. And the disadvantage of this solution are, is uh, obvious. The information has to be resubmitted and manually checked by or reviewed by the authorities. Um, the submission of uh, paper documents is the most common uh, bottleneck in the clearance process. In addition, um, data quality suffers as, uh, as errors can occur during the manual process and the potential for fraud exists. A modern approach is therefore to look at the flow of information holistically and to take this uh, data from the source. To achieve uh, this, WCO supports initiatives to establish standardized electronic business-to-business -business documents. Furthermore, the WCO recommends that customs discontinue the requirements of presenting supporting documents in hard copy. 
if they have already been presented in electronic form and support the use of electronic means to access and to verify the contents of those documents. <clears throat> More information from a trusted source, sources also creates the opportunity to, uh, to, for customs to use uh, AI data analytics or artificial intelligence with the advantage of faster clearance uh, as uh, resource, resources can be focused on suspicious shipments. And decision maker can also make uh, better and uh, data driven decisions using higher quality uh, big data and therefore use uh, available resources more efficiently. And the WCO support, uh, supports its members to improve their uh, data analytic capabilities through online courses and regional uh, and uh, national workshops. Um, a smooth uh, exchange uh, of information can only be made possible if a common language for data exchange is agreed upon. So therefore, the um, WSA data model has been the data foundation for global trade interoperability for over two decades. It was developed to provide uh, a universal language for cross-border data exchange, enabling the implementation of single window system and filling data analytics. It's a compilation of clearly structured, harmonized, uh, standardized, and reusable uh, sets of data definitions and electronic methods designed to meet the key uh, meets operational legal requirements, not only for customs, but also other cross-border regulatory agencies, which are responsible for border management. The um, WC data model is also mapped to other international standards to ensure the global interoperability. Mm -hmm. Through, uh, through inter uh, international convention, uh, on simplification and harmonization of customs procedures, known as the revised Kyoto Convention, uh, one, 133 contracting partners have committed that customs shall apply information technology to support customs operations, and customs shall use uh, relevant internationally accepted standards. So WCO recommends the use of the WCO data model to adopt uh, it for the identification um, and definition of all cross-border regulatory data requirements to use the data elements and identification number and the formatting requirements, which includes the code list in describing and composing the electronic messages. And uh, furthermore, the use of standard electronic message schemas, which are part of the WSU data model package. The WC data model can, uh, can be seen as a dictionary of data elements, uh, which describe pieces of uh, supply chain information in a non-ambiguous way. Um, the uh, data elements are grouped into classes and listed in the WC data model library with information such as the name, uh, definition, and a unique ID number. The information models, um, put the classes into a meaningful relationship in relevance to the prospective procedure. Um, this information model models are the basis for the structure of the electronic messages. And so uh, the WC data model is a multi-purpose da uh, data model, and this is why it needs to be structured into subsets for a, more, for a specific purpose. So we have the first layer is the base information package, which is a broad categorization for a specific business context uh, from which smaller subsets can be derived. So we have um, for the BIP, we have the uh, declaration, which represents the business to business uh, to government messages. We have the response um, for government to business messages. And the intergov for government to government, uh, not only between government uh, agents in the same country, but also in different countries. And uh, the LPCO is representing the supporting documents, licenses, permits, certificates, and other types. And so each type of uh, business application of the WC data model may have its own derived information package. For example, for the maritime interface, there is the International Maritime Organization for Derived Information Package uh, based on the maritime fault forms 
from the IMO4 convention. Um, for import, export, and transit declaration, there is a single administrative document information package. Um, for postal, we have a uh, derived information package based on the uh, Universal Postal Union UPU standard. The, um, the third layer is the My Information package, which is um, particularly, uh, it's, it's not part of the WCO data model as a global standard, but it represents, um, oops, sorry, it represents the uh, national implementation of um, the WCO data model. Um, and uh, um, they, they, my, my information package uh, contain information, uh, 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 may contain all information available in the data model and some other additional information which is relevant to the national environment, uh, such as national legal framework. So creating a My Information Package uh, can be considered as an uh, important step in the implementation process of the WC data model, and it uh, should be developed based on a derived information package, and uh, it's not available based on the based information package. Um, the information which are in the My Information Package uh, can be shared uh, in the My Information Package repository, what we provide uh, on our website to different stakeholders, such as uh, traders and trading partners, as it represents how the data set is confirmed to the W2 data model. The, uh, the My Information Package can be not only be developed by uh, customs administration, but also by the private sector, for example, to, to map their data sets to this global standard, um, the WSO data model, and to exchange this information with, with relevant partners. And we have um, four phases for the development of a My Information Package, um, which is the consolidation, um, from uh, of the data sets from available sources, so sources um, such as paper forms, IT database design, and technical annexes of regulations. Um, but, and the next step is to map this data set to the WC data model. And uh, for this purpose, uh, it can be used um, the mapping tool, which we provide for free on the WC data model app. And um, um, the next step is implementation um, of the output of this My Information Package. Uh, so this can be UML class diagrams, XML schemas, API specification in an IT system. Uh, for example, to create uh, compliance systems, uh, WCO data mode compliance systems, interfaces, and middleware. And uh, we can, the in my information package can be shared with relevant stakeholders through the repository of my information package. So it's important to to mention that the my information package is not developed by the uh, WCO and uh, therefore not part as of the global standard. So the uh, data WCO data model uh, is developed by the um, data model project teams, which is a relevant uh, relevant. Uh, which is uh, responsible to to uh, further develop um, the data model. We have three meetings in a year, and members can submit data maintenance requests to um, enhance um, the WSA data model based on their need. But the My Information package is um, is uh, uh, created and owned by uh, by uh, by the members by the user of the WSA data model application. Where can you find the WC data model? Um, we have it on our website, uh, wcomd.org slash data model. And uh, there you will also find a link to the data model app. Um, the data model, WC data model is free for, for all stakeholders. And um, uh, as I mentioned, it also contains uh, functionalities to map on, on their own data set to the WC data model. And also to, uh, you can explore uh, uh, quite easy uh, uh, with a search function, the whole library, 
you can access um, the relevant Excel sheet and uh, XML schema. So all information related to the data model are available for free on the WSO data model app. Chief uh, end-to-end supply chain digitalization, the WCO supports uh, uh, the uh, International uh, Chamber of Commerce Digital Standards Initiative to establish a globally harmonized digital trade environment. This initiative um, aims to address the fragmentation of the international supply chain. It is committed to uh, promoting policy coherence and harmonizing uh, digital trading standards for the benefit of businesses and government. The WCO takes part as a member uh, to its governance board and particip participates as a technical working group member on key trade documents uh, and data elements. Um, and the objective of this working group is to collect uh, available standards concerning key trade documents and the related uh, data elements used in international trade by private and public sector. The working group focused on developing uh, um, trade document uh, information for eight documents, uh, which are certificates of origin, commercial invoices, warehouse receipts, packing lists, bills of lading, customs declarations, insurance certificates, and customs bonds. Another recent development I would like to present to you is an initiative by the International Federation of Freight Forwarder Association which developed a solution for the members, um, the freight forwarder to issue immutable electronic uh, bill of ladings. In cooperation with uh, this association, the WCO undertook, undertook a mapping of exercise of the um, uh, EFBL part of the uh, data, which are relevant for cross-border regulatory purposes and mapped it with the WCO data model to enable authorities to receive EFBL uh, in uh, WCO data model compliant electronic message format. So before I, uh, I conclude my presentation, I uh, would like to draw your attention, attention uh, of one of our key annual events, what we have uh, uh, from 10 to 12 October 2023. Uh, it's a WCO technology conference and exhibition which uh, will take place in Hanoi, Vietnam, and, and there we will um, uh, uh, exchange uh, experience on technology, on the recent technologies, uh, uh, which uh, application in customs and trade. Though um, uh, who is involved, customs, the private sector, academia, government agencies, and other international organizations. So this is one of our main events um, to discuss technologies, uh, to exchange about te the latest technologies uh, with customs and trade. So thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to respond to your question, which you may have uh, in the following Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. I'm going to ask Elizabeth to maybe put herself on camera. She's from the WCO Regional Office of Capacity Building in Kenya. And then I'm going to ask uh, Jakub, because as we, you all know, colleagues during our presentation or the webinar, um, we ask Jakub to just give it a couple of um, polls that we're running and he's going to share the results. Thank you, Jakub. Thank you very much, uh, Unita. Um, just an extension of thanks for all the, the, the speakers. I think we learned a lot during this webinar. Just a note also, uh, Elizabeth is having some problems connecting, so she might not be on camera, but she will share her thoughts at the end. So just quickly uh, running through the poll questions, and I think uh, we learned a lot with uh, the speakers and then also what the insights we've gained with the question. So in the first instance, we asked participants which automated uh, processing system they use, and most of our colleagues in this region work on uh, Asakuda, but then also, you know, a country specific system. Then secondly, uh, in terms of other government agencies being online, and most are partially integrated with customs and online, but still a lot of OGAs are using a manual process in our region, so a lot of scope to implement digitalization in the region. Then in the third instance, we asked uh, when customs or OGA stop goods, how long does it add to the supply chain? And I think, yeah, once again, we, we 
realize the significant role that digitalization can play. Uh, most of the colleagues uh, listed two to three or even four days or longer to the supply chain, which is of concern. Then uh, we asked, are there enough for IR integrated offerings in the region? Yes. Uh, most colleagues said, but uh, the implementation is lagging. I think that's also the experience what we learned from our colleagues. A lot of colleagues also said no. Then uh, in the next question, the most important technological upgrades needed for the region, and that was uh, split amongst connectivity and digitalization, which are also our lessons learned, but then also uh, case recording and customs to customs data sharing as per the first pillar of the SAFE framework. Then we asked, uh, affected by disruptive technologies? Yes, said most colleagues, but not significantly, 46%. Some said yes and impacted significantly. Then we asked uh, which technology is having the most significant impact on your business, and the most colleagues said the Internet of Things, or then more advanced technologies in terms of artificial intelligence and ma machine learning. Then uh, constraints, and this is as is often the case, a cost constraint and the uptake, but then also the lack of knowledge. And I think this is where this forum also plays a significant and important role to do a lot of capacity building and knowledge sharing. Then we asked uh, your customs authority uh, in terms of adopting the innovators, uh, I presume they come from Mauritius, uh, as our colleagues uh, shared their experience, but mostly um, late majority and some laggards as well. Uh, then lastly, do you think that adopting these technologies is essential for doing business? And the answers were unequivocally that adopting these technologies is essential going into the future. I will stop here, Unita. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob, and thank you, colleagues. I think yeah, Jacob is just a backlash. Maybe if you just mute, then we can. Elizabeth, welcome. I can see you on the call. So um, I think before I hand over to you, it was I just want to um, say a big thank you to all the presenters from uh, Zambia, from Mauritius, and then from the WCO. I think it helps us to gain some insights of what's going on with our region. And maybe, colleagues, you think we can stop here with the good work? We're not. We can uh, take the polling sessions and we can uh, graft it in a document, and then we can uh, share it with the regional private sector group and with you as well. And then we can see what can we do from a private sector point of view to to be much more vocal, to help, to assist, because we want not Africa, as we can see in the polling, to lag. If that's uh, we actually want to bring back technology and make sure that we can be proud of our beautiful continent with Mauritius and our islands to make sure that we one of the regions to look at in for the future. Because as you know, under the WCO, they have six regions and we one of the ESA regions. And I think the work that we're doing, we just can leverage and make sure that all the work's been consolidated under ESA Regional Office for Capacity Building, and I know you will say some uh, closing remarks from your director. So, Elizabeth, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juanita and the team. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to allow us to give the closing remarks today. I hope I'm audible. Please let me know. Y yes, you're audible. Clear. Thank you. Thank you. So hello, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Camuño. I am a program officer with the WCO ESA office, uh, the regional office for capacity building in Nairobi, Kenya. I will deliver the closing remarks on behalf of uh, the WCO ESA director, Mr. Larry Liza, who is currently en route to Nairobi. Uh, we had a session with um, a risk management workshop here in Mombasa and so he is on his way back and has not been able to will not be able to speak however uh, he sends his regards to everybody especially yourself Anita and your team for coordinating and organizing this webinar it has indeed been a very enlightening session I hope everybody who has logged in at some point I know we were about a hundred which is very encouraging so I hope each of us can at least say that they've learned something uh, during this session. Um, thank you all for sharing your insights and contributing to the discussions. 
uh, that has made this webinar very um, highly engaging and informative, as well as sharing your insights on the on the votes that, that uh, Jacob has just presented. We really, really appreciate. The session has covered quite a number of issues, which I think, um, Juanita, you were able to document that uh, very well. I will just highlight what I was personally able to pick up on, which is um, key for us in customs and also um, especially in line with uh, our WCO safe framework for standards, which somebody had highlighted. I think it was um, uh, Charang Singh who highlighted that the safe framework of standard is very much in line with this session where we are urged to collaborate with customs to customs, customs to partner government agencies and also customs to business. So some of the th key things that I have been able to take down was the implementation of the TFA in uh, um, Zimbabwe, uh, in Zambia, sorry, uh, which was quite enlightening to know the role of the National Trade uh, Facilitation Committee is there. To, um, we have also been um, informed more on uh, the need to embrace technology, especially in the trade supply environment. Uh, trade uh, technology has been identified to be a key enabler of ensuring that we bring down the cost of doing business, which essentially is good for us. Um, we are constantly singing the need for trade facilitation and to improve our trade environment and technology has been identified to be a key enabler for that. The other thing that I took note of and I thought was quite interesting was the challenges uh, in information systems. This was well brought out by Christopher, I think, Ranch, Ranch Nish, I think it was. Um, challenges of um, in information systems and he made a call to all of us to identify more areas of collaboration in digitalization to bring down the cost of doing business and eliminate duplication. Finally, there was the need to embrace flexibility, which was well captured and to embrace technology as well. We have well been appraised on the resistance that comes with change and the speaker requested us to embrace technology because the pros are definitely more and more beneficial to us than the cons. So finally, I just want to close and say that this session was uh, very well aligned to our WCO theme of this year, 2023, in nurturing the next generation promoting a culture of knowledge sharing and professional trade and customs. So I think we are well, um, well aligned to the theme and I would still encourage all the participants, including the private sector, our partner government agencies and customs to continue engaging in such forums in order to um, ensure that we continuously share our experiences and learn from each other. Finally, I wish to thank the WCO ESA RPSG for organizing this webinar. And we cannot wait to uh, be engaged in other, other webinars. Please be ensured of our continued support and collaboration. Thank you also to the participants for listening, for sharing, for your questions, for your comments and feedback. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you. I take back the meeting to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you all and have a lovely Thursday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so very much and bye everyone. Thank you. Good Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Greetings, Larry, from the plane. Bye bye. Mm. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Bye bye. I'm Deborah Motajiti. Bye bye. Bye-bye, thank you.